Hello friends, today we're going to be looking at the topic of pushing one's views on other people. Often people can become upset or annoyed by religious views being pushed upon them. I can empathize with this because I've been in the presence of individuals who have constantly forced the issue, pushing their views upon somebody who self-evidently does not want to be in this dialogue. At the same time, I think there's a difference between expressing one's views and pushing one's views, between preaching at someone and sharing one's belief in an open, if you will, marketplace of ideas. There is in the Baha'i faith a, if you will, prohibition against proselytizing. And it's important to understand what that is. It's also important to understand, I think, why people of various belief systems do this, why they are sharing their views, often at times in a very passionate and at times overbearing way. And I think it's important to understand that we find this, if you will, behavior not only within the religious domain, but in various, various belief systems. This is the topic we'll be exploring today. It is important to know that proselytizing is forbidden in the Baha'i faith. Yet oftentimes we don't look into what it means to be proselytizing, so we can't understand what it is that is forbidden. So we're going to start with a letter from the Universal House of Justice. At the same time, however, we are forbidden to proselytize. So it is important for all believers to understand the difference between teaching and proselytizing. It is a significant difference. And in some countries where teaching a religion is permitted, but proselytizing is forbidden, the distinction is made in the law of the land. Proselytizing implies bringing undue pressure to bear upon someone to change his faith. It is also usually understood to imply the making of threats or the offering of material benefits as an inducement to conversion. In some countries, missions, schools, or hospitals, for all the good they do, are regarded with suspicion and even aversion by the local authorities because they are considered to be material inducements to conversion and hence instruments of proselytization. In this quote from Universal House of Justice, they're saying it's important for every Baha'i to understand the difference between teaching and proselytization, and that the difference is significant. It also goes on to say that in some countries, it is up to the law of the land. It is actually particularly defined, and that is important because as Baha'is, we are to be obedient to the governments under which we reside. The issue arising here is bringing undue pressure or offering material benefits. And why is this, if you will, so blameworthy and to be forbidden? Because it is taking the acceptance of a belief system out of the domain of regarding it as true, beautiful, or sacred, and actually making it a prudent or expedient choice to avoid the threat or to gain the benefit. So within the Baha'i faith, proselytization is bringing undue pressure upon someone so that they're not accepting a belief system, not accepting the message of Baha'u'llah because they believe it to be true, beautiful, and sacred, but rather because it is to avoid pain or to get benefits. Baha'u'llah in the hidden word says, O son of dust, the wise are they that speak not unless they obtain a hearing, even as the cupbearer who preferreth not his cup till he findeth a seeker, and the lover who crieth not out from the depths of his heart until he gazeth upon the beauty of his beloved. On page 55 of the Advent of Divine Justice, a letter which is primarily directed towards exhorting the friends to fulfill their responsibilities in teaching the faith, Shoghi Effendi writes, Care, however, should at all times be exercised, lest in their eagerness to further the international interests of the faith they frustrate their purpose and turn away 
through any act that might be misconstrued as an attempt to proselytize and bring undue pressure upon them, those whom they wish to win over to their cause. Some Baha'is sometimes overstep the proper bounds, but this does not alter the clear principle. In the first section of this quote from The Hidden Words, the wise are they that speak not unless they have tamed a hearing. And I think that it is quite obvious when you have not obtained a hearing. If you are sharing with someone Baha'u'llah's message, and that individual very obviously does not wish to continue this conversation, wishes to remove themselves from the dialogue, you simply apologize and excuse yourself. Because that individual is actually not seeking, so don't prefer the cup. And I think generally it's important to notice that we do know when this is happening. We offer a gift. If an individual does not wish to actually receive that gift, we take it back and we move on and offer that gift to someone else. The second section of the quote talks about how there is an eagerness to further the interests of the faith, but we actually have to make sure that we're being careful that it's not perceived as proselytization, not perceived as bringing undue pressure upon people to accept the faith. The responsibility of the Baha'is to teach the faith is very great. The contraction of the world and the onward rush of events require us to seize every chance open to us to touch the hearts and minds of our fellow men. The message of Baha'u'llah is God's guidance for mankind to overcome the difficulties of this age of transition and move forward into the next stage of its evolution. And human beings have the right to hear it. Those who accept it incur the duty of passing it on to their fellow man. The slowness of the response of the world has caused and is causing great suffering. Hence the historical pressure upon Baha'is to exert every effort to teach the faith for the sake of their fellow men. They should teach with enthusiasm, conviction, wisdom, and courtesy, but without pressing their hearer, bearing in mind the words of Baha'u'llah, Beware lest ye contend with anyone, nay, strive to make him aware of the truth with kindly manner and most convincing exhortation. If your hearer respond, he will have responded to his own behoof, and if not, turn ye away from him and set your faces towards God's sacred court, the seat of resplendent holiness. Here the Universal House of Justice acknowledges that the responsibility of a Baha'i to teach the faith is very great. That it requires us to receive every chance to touch the hearts of our fellow men. And it states here that human beings have the right to hear it. And it's interesting the wording because we don't want to deprive someone the right to hear the message of Baha'u'llah. This is why I was saying when we're talking about the wise who speak not unless they've attained a hearing, it doesn't mean you wait for someone to ask. It's that we're sharing with the world, sharing with our brothers and sisters, the gem of Baha'u'llah's teaching. If they themselves choose then not to receive that gift, we take it to another. Here as well it says, the slowness of the response of the world has caused and has caused great suffering. We're going to come back to this topic, which is that it is a genuine act of trying to help the world when one is teaching one's faith. And it says they should teach with enthusiasm, conviction, wisdom, and courtesy, but without pressing their hearer. Once again, I think we can generally see, sense, when someone feels they're being pressed when they themselves are not interested in the dialogue. Now that doesn't mean that they disagree and that therefore they don't want to be in the dialogue. We can often disagree very intensely with a, view with a viewpoint, some belief system, and yet wish to be in the dialogue, in that exchange of ideas and the critical examination of beliefs. It's very different when, and I think most of us can tell, when you perceive someone who wishes to exit that discussion. In such a case, I would propose that would be pressing the hearer. 
when looking at people who are sharing their beliefs with you, or when you're sharing your beliefs with someone else, it's always important to actually consider the intention behind why someone's doing that. When I was growing up, I had friends who would come and they would share their beliefs, for example, in Jesus Christ. Or I had family members who would talk about Jesus or, or share prayers. When I actually encountered this, even individuals knocking on my door, wanting to come in and discuss, for example, Christianity, I never took this as offensive or as pressing one's belief. I actually really saw that I had a choice. I could say I'm not interested in this. The reason why I didn't find this annoying was because I saw the intention behind the individual. These were not like many people within the marketing or advertising world who are coming to me with some product or putting up some big marketing ad, some placard that was actually trying to sell me something for their own benefit. These individuals were coming to me with a message, which I disagreed with, that they believed was beautiful, that they believed was to enrich my life give me the purpose and meaning of life, and to actually better the world. That was the intention behind why they were sharing. And for myself, I could actually see that intention and see it as beautiful, enter into a dialogue with them, and try to examine their beliefs. So in many ways, I didn't see this as an offensive or upsetting act, especially given that we live in a culture where we are constantly and constantly bombarded by, if you will, corporate and political propaganda. Where advertising and marketing just covers almost our entire culture. I don't actually feel that is upsetting or a cause of anger. This is a free market of ideas and products, and it is up to me to choose. So. When someone comes to you and actually is sharing their belief system, try to understand why it is that they're doing this. What is the motivation behind it? If they're doing it because they want to make a buck, I would suggest that that might be more annoying <laughs> than if someone's coming to you trying to give you a gift, a conceptual spiritual gift that is the most beautiful thing to them in the world. The world is in great turmoil, and its problems seem to become daily more acute. We should therefore not sit idle, otherwise we would be failing in carrying out our sacred duty. Baha'u'llah has not given us his teachings to treasure them and hide them for our personal delight and pleasure. He gave them to us that we may pass them from mouth to mouth until all the world becomes familiar with them and enjoys their blessings and uplifting influence. So the Baha'i teachings are not some treasure that we're supposed to take and hide away. This is to solve the problems of the world. That it is to be given from mouth to mouth, from heart to heart, so that each individual may become familiar with them, and if they so choose, enjoy their blessings and their uplifting influence. Why do I myself share the teachings of Baha'u'llah with the people that I meet? Why do I want to communicate to my brothers and sisters on this little planet we inhabit the teachings of Baha'u'llah? I'm going to start first with a quote from The Guardian. The more one observes the conditions of the world and the terrible problems confronting humanity, the more deeply one realizes that the only remedy is that which Baha'u'llah has brought. And yet, alas, the masses of the people seem to not yet be aware that the way out of our problems can only be a divine way, given by something far greater than human understanding. However, many souls are seriously thinking and seeking, and the Baha'is must try to bring the knowledge of the teachings to all so that those prepared to accept may not be denied the message. Every Baha'i, however humble or inarticulate, must become intent on fulfilling his role as a bearer of the divine message. Indeed, 
How can a true believer remain silent while around us men cry out in anguish for truth, love, and unity to descend upon this world? In the first quote, Shoghi Avini says that we should not deny people the message. Because when we look at the world, we see that the problems that are, it is facing are very intense and that it is the message of Baha'u'llah that is going to be able to alleviate the suffering of humankind. In the quote from the Universal House of Justice, how can a true believer remain silent while around us men cry out in anguish for truth, love, and unity to descend upon the world? I know for myself, when I encountered Baha'u'llah's message and studied it and accepted it, I accepted it as the remedy for the world's problems. It's like as if I had come across, say, some technological innovation. I myself invented something that would clean the oceans, get rid of all the garbage and pollution within them. And yet, I then remain silent and do not share that with human humanity. Or, for example, I find a way that I can actually solve food security issues. I can make sure that everyone, through this technological advancement, would actually get fed. Or, for example, I was able to remove all the pollutions or fix global warming. And I'm given this technology, or I'm dis I've discovered this technology. How would you or anyone else feel if I had actually found this discovery, truly believed it could solve it, and did not share it with humankind as much as I possibly could? You might believe that the technology doesn't work. <laughs> you might believe that it cannot clean the oceans, it cannot solve the energy crisis, for example. It cannot solve food shortages. But if you know that I believe that it will do so, and then you see me remaining silent, I think it's very understandable that you would be frustrated with me. How much more if you found out the technology actually worked, that it could solve the energy crisis, it could fall, solve food shortages, or wipe out all pollution. But if you then found out, my Lord, this actually works, this technology can do what he claims, and then you see me remaining silent, naturally, frustration or even anger might arise. Now that can only be cashed out, if you will, in the investigation of the technology to see if it does what it says. And this is the case with the teachings of Baha'u'llah as they are applied to the body politic of our globe. I myself believe that the administrative order of the Baha'i faith its political and economic conceptions, and its social teachings and the very sacredness that it brings into one's own life are the remedy for the world's ills. Therefore, it's actually annoying if I do not share that with people because it would make me ingenuine. I'm going to read a quote now from Shoghi Effendi that is very important for me in my life and that we as Baha'is understand. There is so much suffering, such a great and desperate need for a true remedy, and the Baha'is should realize their sacred obligation is to deliver the message to their fellow men at once, and on as large scale as possible. If they fail to do so, they are really partly responsible for prolonging the agony of humanity. This is a very heavy quote from Shoghi Effendi because it brings us really face to face with the duty we have, the sacred duty we have, to share as much as we possibly can the teachings of Baha'u'llah with the world, because if we don't, we prolong humankind's suffering. This is perfectly in line with the analogies I was just using, that if we actually had serious pollution, which we do, and I have a technology that can solve it, but I don't really try hard to actually share it and to get accepted and prove that it's true and that it works, I actually prolong the ecological devastation as it goes. If I have a way to solve major problems within the world and I sit back and keep that knowledge to myself and guard it, 
because I do not wish other people to look poorly on me because they don't believe it works yet, then I am partly responsible for the continued damage to humankind. This brings us right back to that issue of intention. Why do I want to share Baha'u'llah's message? Because it brings into one's life beauty. It gives purpose and meaning to one's existence. I believe it to be true. And I believe it to be the social technology that is going to heal the massive amount of problems that humankind is now facing. How could I then remain silent? There is, however, a far more personal aspect to why I think it is natural and even necessary to share one's, if you will, beliefs in Baha'u'llah and the Baha'i Faith or in Islam or atheism or secularism or New Ageism. Why it is so necessary in order to be a loving and genuine person that this must become more common in culture. Why is this? I do not wish to edit who I am for people, nor do I wish them to edit who they are to me. I understand the role, if you will, of commonplace day-to-day -day dialogue. But if I'm truly honest, I want to know what you, what my friends, my colleagues and family really genuinely love, hope for, and dream about. What they aspire to be. What their most close-held beliefs are. Why? Because I don't want either another person nor myself to have to cull my personality, my beliefs, and my character before others. To keep them, if you will, hidden. This isn't a demand for agreement, but simply that we actually share our beliefs with each other in that open field. And when we don't, I think we close ourselves off to the most heartfelt and deepest loves and beliefs of the individuals before us. For myself, I remember one of the first times this really, really, really came through from another person. I had actually moved away from my hometown. And in part, I had actually moved away from my hometown because I really wanted to be able to begin to express what I believed were beautiful and wonderful. And I didn't feel capable at that time doing that in this town in which I had grown up. When I moved to this town uh, in Alberta, Calgary, Alberta, and Canada, I started working on a loading dock. And on the loading dock, there were two individuals. One was a Muslim and, and one was a Hindu. And I would actually have lunch with these individuals quite often throughout the weeks. At that point in my life, I had begun very, very, if you will, clandestinely to study the comparative religion. And I, but I didn't really know anything. And I didn't really know anything about Islam or Hinduism. So I began talking to these two individuals and asking them questions about their own beliefs about their own traditions, their own religions. And one of the things that stood out most to me was actually how they came alive. How there was sort of a glow to them. And I could see that it was because I was asking them about something important. Something that they loved. Something that was very, very close to their heart. That, if you will, formed a, the, the fabric of who they were. And I realized that that was the issue I was having because I wanted to talk about things I truly cared about. They weren't Islam or Hinduism, but there was those things within me, my deep felt beliefs, hopes, and dreams that I wanted to share. And I no longer wanted to edit myself, chopping off parts, culling off parts, if you will, to present an edited me to the world. And I saw that these two individuals, when I was talking to them, felt the same. They wanted to be open about what they believed, what they loved, and what they hoped for. So if we wish to connect, it's critical that we actually move beyond the surface level of discussion and begin, instead of actually trying to push away someone's 
deeply heartfelt beliefs that don't accord with our own, but actually inviting them out so that we can share and begin as a culture to learn to dialogue more openly about what is precious to us. So that people can be their true selves and in cordial dialogue not be attacked, but have dialogue begin. I think this is especially important in our culture, really in any culture, because the idea of pushing one's beliefs on another is something that only seems to be perceived when it is a minority position that is being voiced. It's kind of like if you go to a different country and someone tells you that you, they like your accent. <laughs> Say if I'm actually in Britain and someone's like, well, you have an, an interesting accent. From my own perspective, I don't have an accent. <laughs> I'm Canadian and this is the way you know, English speakers talk. Whereas a British person or a Scottish person or an Irish person or any individual speaking English, they have the accent. It's because the dominant way of speaking is the way I speak and somebody else who's coming up is pushing their accent on me. This is the case, I believe, in our culture because we live in a highly, highly secular culture. A culture in which discussions of deep meaning and purpose, and especially religion, are not really acceptable dialogues. Yet secular values, and even irreligious values, oftentimes are fully acceptable within almost any context. This is why I often think of it as interesting because people will say, well, you're pushing your views. And I say, well, some people actually are often really pushing back. It's not that they're pushing their views, they're pushing back. They're, in some sense, the small voice that is rarely heard. You see, we, we actually live in a culture where there's a constant flow of ideas. People are always expressing their values and their loves and their, how they use their time. They, people talk about their political views, their economic views, and oftentimes don't realize that that is, would be defined if it wasn't the dominant view, and they would be defined as actually pushing their views. I remember once I was actually at work and a friend of mine, a coworker of mine, we were in a big lunchroom and this coworker of mine asked me my opinion on Buddhism. So he asked me about certain aspects of Buddhism, in fact, and said, you know, what do you think, Rob? Like, and I actually mean as a Baha'i. So I started talking and as, as I continued on, I talked for a couple of minutes and all of a sudden a, a friend of mine, actually, a coworker of mine across the, the lunchroom said, like, come on, Rob. Like, just like, give it up, man. Like, you, know, you don't want to be just push your views on people, right? Can you just let up? And it was interesting to me because I said to this individual, well, first of all, I wasn't talking to you. <laughs> um, this, this friend of mine asked me a question. We were having a private conversation about religion. And he's like, I know, but this isn't the place for it. And again, I found this very interesting because this particular individual would regularly bring up economic issues, political issues, and social issues in the lunchroom. And often, versions of them that I all entirely disagree with, and I would then speak up and have a discussion with him about them in the lunchroom. So why was it that I was seen as pushing my views on people in the room? Especially at this point of time in my career, individuals were constantly having discussions. And oftentimes, I would actually enter the room and there would be an anti-religious discussion going on and people would suddenly go quiet. So how was this pushing views? I would suggest because it is not the dominant view. And because it is often a very challenging topic. If I had been in agreement, it would have been okay. So in some sense, it's important to realize that as we move through our life in this culture, at this point in time, there is a very, very dominant secular worldview that can be expressed freely. So in, but at the same time, we can't have the opposite opinions or very religious or very even meaningful at time viewpoints be put forward without opposition. But this makes it not an open marketplace of idea, ideas, sorry. 
it means that we're not really actually having a discussion. And that is the problem. So I think it's important to realize that when we talk about people pushing their views, that as I walk through my, my culture, I am often bombarded, as are my children, with a whole series of values, political perspectives, social perspectives that are constantly going on, almost inundating us as we move through schools, workplaces, places of business, in media generally. And I know that for myself, it's often seen as if I'm trying to offer a very small voice, something that isn't regularly heard. So in a sense, it is pushing back and trying to offer another way to see things. I would like now to share a quote from Shoghi Effendi, the guardian of the Baha'i faith, from the work, The Advent of Divine Justice. Every laborer in those fields, whether as traveling teacher or settler, should, I feel, make it his chief and constant concern to mix in a friendly manner with all sections of the population, irrespective of class, creed, nationality, or color, to familiarize himself with their ideas, tastes, and habits, to study the approach best suited to them, to concentrate patiently and tactfully on a few who have shown marked capacity and receptivity, and to endeavor with extreme kindness to implant such love, zeal, and devotion in their hearts as to enable them to become in turn self-sufficient and independent promoters of the faith in their respective localities. Consort with all men, O people of Baha, is Baha'u'llah's admonition in a spirit of friendliness and fellowship. If ye be aware of a certain truth, if ye possess a jewel of which others are deprived, share it with them in a language of utmost kindliness and goodwill. If it be accepted, if it fulfill its purpose, your object is attained. If anyone should refuse it, leave him unto himself and beseech God to guide him. Beware lest ye deal unkindly with him. A kindly tongue is a lodestone of the hearts of men. It is the bread of the spirit. It clotheth the words with meaning. It is a fountain of the light of wisdom and understanding. This is an exquisite quote. Because it talks about different facets of sharing truth with individuals. It talks about how our chief concern should be to mix with people of all cross sections of society and then to study their beliefs, their habits, their tendencies, and try to find the best way that we can share Baha'u'llah's message with that cross section of society. And that we're to consort with them with friendliness and fellowship. And if we possess this jewel, which we believe we have, to share it with someone, if they accept it, our object is attained. And if not, leave them to themselves. This is the free choice of any individual. But we can't give them that choice unless first we offer to them. <laughs> we don't want to deny them the right to actually have it. And then the second issue is, okay, well, are we actually sharing this with friendliness and kindness, with a kindly tongue? And if so, when we're actually sharing it with them, are we trying to understand what is the best approach suited to that individual? Have we tried to familiarize ourselves with this individual and how they see the world? If in the end that is not accepted, then that's fine. That's the free choice of that individual. Move on. If as we're trying to share this jewel and if we've done so in a spirit of friendliness, if we've offered to them as if they are a king or a queen, and we share that belief with them in a way that they can understand it. And they actually obviously do not wish to continue this conversation. We do not want to push upon them or bring undue pressure. Therefore, we leave them to themselves. 
change the topic. This final section is related to a specific term, conversion. Like proselytizing, I think it's often misunderstood. That if in a sense we bring our conceptual and social baggage to that term, as opposed to trying to understand it. I think it's important that we really look at actually the words that are used by the central figures of the Baha'i Faith and understand how they're being used and what they actually mean, rather than simply reacting to a term. It's like with the, uh, with the term argument. Uh, Abdul Baha, Shoghi Effendi, Baha'u'llah all use the term arguments and to argue. To, which means to produce a reasoned defense of some position. Oftentimes we hear the term argue, and we hear people getting angry, raising their voices, if you will, being you know, socially and conceptually belligerent. But that's not what the term is actually means within the writings, or within the concept of academic or critical discourse. So it's important not to bring our associations with the term argument to that discussion. That's why I think it's important to look at proselytization, what actually would really be, if you will, proselytizing or pushing one's belief. Like for the example, bringing undue pressure on someone by threats or the offer of material rewards. I also would include, as we've seen, the concept of actually constantly and constantly pushing the topic of discussion when someone really, really, really self-evidently doesn't want to be part of it as separate from someone who is actually challenging your worldview. That isn't someone who doesn't want the discussion, that's often someone who really wants to have the discussion. When it comes to conversion, oftentimes within Baha'i discourse and in Baha'i gatherings, people will say, well, we're not trying to convert people. And I would say, of, of course we are. Of course we're trying to convert people. And that term is actually used by the central figures. Before we go into more concepts, I'd like to actually read some of those quotes. It is really strange how much modern thinkers are, of their own accord, drawing nearer to the teachings of the faith and voicing views very much like ours. It shows clearly the truth of the sayings of the Master, that the spirit of the movement has permeated the hearts of all the people of the world. It is God's hands operating and guiding the nations and intellectual men and leaders of society to a gradual acceptance of his message revealed through Baha'u'llah. The way we can hasten the development of this process is by doing our share in spreading the words of God far and wide. Even though we may not see any case of sudden conversion on the part of these intellectuals, Yet they are bound to be influenced in their views and look to the faith with greater admiration and with a more willing desire to be led by its precepts. Shoghi Effendi, therefore, wishes me to encourage you in your work in sending appropriate literature to such men of learning. Okay, in this first quote, we're actually said to be sharing the teachings as much as we can so that even if an individual if we may not see any case of sudden conversion on the part of these intellectuals, they're bound to be influenced. So we may be hoping to convert them, but that's not the case, yet they can still cause an influence within the social and intellectual discourse of society. Again, from The Guardian. Even though the men you contact do not immediately embrace the cause and wholeheartedly support it, Yet the word of God that has penetrated their mind and heart will not remain idle. They will be bound, once they read something or lend an attentive ear, to unconsciously modify their views, for the message will be gradually working in their subconscious mind, and thereby molding their views and interests. One day the cause will pass the threshold of their consciousness, and they will become completely converted. But even before that day, they will be expressing that spirit in their deliberations and thereby helping the progress of the cause of peace throughout the world. On the one hand, greater publicity to the aims and purposes of the faith and of paving the way on the other 
for the eventual conversion of a selected number of capable and receptive souls who will reinforce the ranks of its active and unreserved supporters. So in this quote again, it is the sharing of the message as best you can. Individuals will gradually modify their beliefs and that one day the cause will pass the threshold of their consciousness and they will become completely converted. A community destined, as prophesied by Abdul Baha, to play a major role in the spiritual awakening and the ultimate conversion of the European peoples and races to his father's faith. Your conversion to his cause is indeed a historic event and will greatly rejoice the hearts of the believers. I will pray for your success and spiritual advancement from the depths of my heart. Rest assured and be confident. Your true brother, Shogi. So the term conversion is consistently used in the writings. I just chose a several actual collections of the writings of Shoghi Effendi. We could have gone on and found, I would genuinely say, hundreds of instances where it talks about mass conversion or converting people. I think the problem is, is that we often hear the term converting as proselytizing. One, as if we're actually pressuring someone into accepting something. Or two, the idea that somehow we are truly responsible, we are the authority figure, and we have changed and transformed them. But that's actually not what it means. It means being and facilitating someone's own autonomous free will choice to move from one belief system to another. That is conversion. And it is something I would suggest that all of us want to and hope to do. Um, I was once invited to a, a discussion at a dinner with a whole bunch of people. I've mentioned this previously in Deepenings. Um, and in the room was actually a Christian, a secularist, an atheist, a Muslim, myself, and others of those categories, if you will. And it was interesting because we got there together to, uh, to really have a discussion about deep and important matters, including religion. The stage was set. And at one point I said, you know, it's, I think it's important to, to realize something as friends and acquaintances, and acquaintances here. And it's this. And I turned to one of the friends and I said, you know, you yourself are a Muslim. And... I think it's important to acknowledge that you believe Islam to be true. That's why you're a Muslim. And you want everyone else in this room to accept Islam. And you believe that the world would be a better place if everyone accepted Islam. And you believe people's current perspectives are wrong. And it was a very uncomfortable moment. And I, and I said, if it helps, I myself am a Baha'i. <laughs> I promote Baha'i teachings. I believe the Baha'i faith to be true. I believe it to be the remedy for the ills of humankind. And while I believe most of you actually have a part of the truth, we all do, uh, I do generally believe that you're wrong. And I want to do my best to show you why. And then again, I went through to my secular friend. I said, you know, you yourself believe that religion, and I, we were friends, I said, you yourself believe religion to be a negative influence upon culture. You believe that our Muslim friend here and our Christian friend here and myself are wrong and in some sense deluded in our belief that these are divine messengers. And again, it was an uncomfortable moment. And I said, and that's okay. And I think what's important is, is we have to come to a place where that's okay. Because that's just us being honest about what we truly believe. We can say it in a loving and compassionate way. But this is true all around the room. If, I, if there was a Hindu in the room, a Buddhist in the room, a Muslim, a Christian, a Jew, a Zoroastrian, an atheist, an agnostic, or a New Ager, we're all going to be in a room and we believe what we believe because we think it's true. And we hope, and sometimes actively work for, the state of affairs where other people accept what we believe, we're trying to convert them. Every time I've had a discussion with my secular friends, when it comes to matters of belief, they're trying to give me reasons why I shouldn't be a Baha'i, why I shouldn't accept these as divine messengers. 
that would be an attempt to convert me, which is really just a concept of trying to share reasons, arguments, not bringing, not being mean or not, or failing to use a kindly tongue or being belligerent or pressing upon someone when they wish to exit a conversation, but sharing those reasons as to why they believe that I'm wrong so that I will see the truth and actually come to their side. This is just what critical dialogue is. So every time you've ever been in a debate or a dialogue or a discussion, be it in university, college, workplace, whatever, that is an attempt at conversion. It is not using coercion, which is different, but it is simply trying to persuade somebody that this is the most beautiful and truest concept that you know. So to wrap all this up, <laughs> proselytization is the bringing of undue pressure upon people, whether through threats or material rewards, and even if you will, pressing someone into accepting to have this discussion with you when they self-evidently don't want to. Teaching, on the other hand, I would suggest is actually just sharing. It's sharing one's own belief system in what should be an open marketplace of ideas, where we can freely discuss different worldviews and try and convert each other <laughs> by sharing the reasons and rationales behind why we believe what we believe. And that can only be done if we truly have a culture where those are free discussions. It is important as well to realize that even if the person in front of you is dead wrong in what they believe, try to see what their intention is. Because I know with myself, the reason why I try to promote the teachings of Baha'u'llah and his administrative order is because I believe that you too will see its beauty, that it would be the most beautiful thing in your life just as it is in mine, that it defines the purpose and meaning of one's existence, it is the end goal of human existence in this day, the acceptance of the manifestation of God for our time. And within that, I actually believe that this is the best way that I can carry forward an ever advancing civilization and solve the problems that are facing humankind to heal our sicknesses and to bring us through this critical transitional phase into a glorious world civilization. It is as if I am holding with me a technological invention that I believe will actually solve the energy crises that humankind is facing and all the other crises that humankind is facing. Therefore, it would be ingenuine of me and actually immoral of me to take that message and hide it and keep it for myself. So even if in the end we do not agree, it's important to understand that is my intention in sharing my worldviews. It is an expression of love and caring for my world. Thank you very much.